In this week's episode of Basically Detectives, we discuss the second episode of The Night Stalker. I read a comment from one of our listeners in a terrible accent and find out why I can't watch another episode right now of Richard Ramirez. Hey everyone, hey, 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 it is Kai and Rick back again to talk about a new episode of, well, our new segment of Basically Detectives, where we discuss true crime documentaries. We just talk about it. We just tell you what we're watching. You come with what you what, what you saw. We come with what we saw. And we merge together into a beautiful episode. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, we are discussing, well, Rick's going to tell us what we're discussing. But if you don't know who we are, I'm Kai and this is Rick. And we are the hosts of Love and Murder podcast, where we talk about true crime cases gone terribly wrong. We have episodes that come out every week on Sunday. And it's just a weekly, really informative, kind of fun, true crime podcast where we discuss relationships that turn to murder. And then this segment that we're doing is a brand new segment of Basically Detectives, where, like I said, we discuss true crime documentaries that we've watched and we encourage you to watch with us and then chime in. And speaking of chime in, we have one of our listeners who did chime in from last week's episode. So last week we watched episode one of The Night Stalker, which is the, uh, what's his name? Ramirez. It's the case of Richard Ramirez. Yeah. And we watched episode one and one of our listeners did chime in. Now, uh, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. She didn't send an SOS, which I implore y'all to send an SOS so you can hear your thoughts on our show. So you go to our our website, www.murderandlove.com. And right there on the homepage is our SOS, which is our our new shout out system. So she decided to actually write this in and she made some really good points. So, you know, I have to say it on air. However, she's British. So I told her, of course, I have to put on my British accent. And I also told her this is her fault. So if y'all want to blame her for what y'all about to hear, (laughs) y'all could join our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash. Wow, you are about to make her the victim of your joke and you're blaming it all on the victim. (laughs) I am blaming it on her. I thought you had a spine, Kai. I thought you had morals here. Victim blaming. So you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And uh, yeah. You can blame her over there. <laughs> Five dollars or above tier. So the first episode was last week, Wednesday. So if you haven't uh, listened to it, go back and just listen to the first episode of Basically Detectives. And this episode, we're going to be talking about the second episode of The Night Stalker. However, after this, we're jumping to another show for a little while because uh, Kai's mental health kind of needs it. This second episode of Night Stalker really, it, it really bothered me. And I ended up having nightmares and stuff. So... I'm going to jump from this this uh, show. We're going to go to another episode for um, basically Detectives Episode 3. But yeah, right now we're going to go ahead and put on my British accent and say what our listener said. And then we're going to get into Episode 2 of The Night Stalker. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm going to have to message this user directly and be like, look, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't even know. Like, I'm going to quit the show because like, I can't do this anymore. It's all Kai's <laughs> fault. <laughs> no, literally, I said, uh, what did I say to her? Hold on. I said, but you forced me to read this in my, quote, British accent. You only have yourself to blame for this atrocity ahead. This is what I told her. So she just told me to make sure it's in a, what did she say? She said, make sure it is in a common British accent because she's near London. It's not going to be. Oh, I (laughs) said, yeah, it's going to be so uncommon. You're going to wonder if it's even from Earth. Not only do I have to do a British accent, now she's asking me to, to like, have a dialect? Like, are you serious? Really? <laughs> yeah. Does she not know you aren't that skilled enough to do that? Like, what's wrong with her? Look, look. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's just try for the British, period. The general term of what everybody think is a British accent. Let's just try for that. All right. I'm telling you, this this person has put up with a lot from us. If we ever make it, like, huge, big, I am going to personally fly out there and buy her fish and chips for all of this bullcrap. <laughs> yeah. Go through. All right. You know who you are. I'm coming for you. <laughs> so this is from our Patre- one of our Patreons, our lovely lambs. Her name is Stacy Marie. And this is what she said. My first thoughts on episode one of Ramirez was listening to his quotes, how they make little sense and how insane he sounds. There is no logic to his thinking. 
can we please, for the love of God, mention these artist impressions of victim descriptions, how off base they were? Now, I'm going to stop right there because... Thank God. Shut up. <laughs> Did You thought the artist impressions were off? Well, that's, that's the thing. They're artist impressions and they're, they're being guided by people who only saw like what they saw. So I'll be honest, when they, when they put the two different pictures together... And they were like, oh, it's the same guy. I'm like, that's not the same guy. What are you talking about? I, I didn't I didn't see that, to be honest with you. But I'm not a detective, so maybe well, I don't have me, like a third eye. it kind of looked eye. like the same guy. Maybe I just didn't look close enough. But then again, I don't know because I don't remember what Richard Ramirez looks like. So maybe y'all are looking at the artist sketch and you know what he looks like. But I don't even remember what he looks like. And I don't want to go ahead to see what he looks like. So it's unfolding. I, I have the kind of thing where like if you show me a baby... And you're like, oh, the baby looks like his father. I'm like, no, it looks like a baby. But when they showed these two pictures side by side of the drawings, I, I honestly couldn't tell like they were supposed to be the same guy. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, like I'm looking at it. And I'm like, I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but I, I, I guess it worked out. So I can't really complain. What do the rest of y'all think? Do you, do you think it looked like the same guy? Do you agree with uh, Rick and Stacy? To me, to me, it looked like the same guy, but maybe I... First of all, I'm not artistic, so maybe that's what it was. And maybe I didn't look long enough. So so both of y'all agree. The two detectives were brilliant. The miserable yet seasoned, thorough, experienced old hand mixed with the young Mexican with seriously good insight and skills, yet has a great sense of humor. And that's humor with an O-R, by the way. H-U-M-O-U-R. So British. <laughs> Stacy, I am making fun of you. <laughs> one balancing out the other and each learning from the other. Um, that kind of sounds like our detectives, Johnson and McWilliamson. <laughs> the seasoned yet uh, brilliant. Uh, well, no, McWilliamson isn't brilliant. He's just seasoned and old and he just feels too old for this shit. And then Johnson is brilliant, but he's new. For the detectives in the story, it's, it's like they're working together and they're making progress. McWilliamson and Johnson, they're just kind of like, you know, putting up with the experience together. <laughs> but yeah, I did agree. I did like the two of them together. I, I did. I, I liked the... So the first guy, he's Italian. Yeah. And he was just amazing at his job. He's the one who caught the strangler. And the second guy, he's Mexican and he's completely new. And he was like the youngest one under force and everything like that at the time. And he was just, he was just really insightful and brilliant. And he took his job seriously, but at the same time, you know, he had a great sense of humor, but that changed didn't see in episode two. So wait, wait for it. Anyways, not saying that he was bad at his job, but his, his personality and you'll see why. Anyways, I was shocked he's, he lets the kids go and didn't murder them. I agree. I agree with that. I was shocked about that too. I was wondering what was the psychology behind that. And the woman's account of when she was his six-year-old victim was really sad. Looks like she's still repressing a lot of that. Did you realize that? Like, did you look like at that while she was giving her account of it? You see her face and you can see her reliving it. I was kind of impressed that she was able to stay as composed as she was because you can just see it in her eyes. She has that like thousand yard stare yeah. where like she's talking to the camera, but she's not really talking to anybody. She's kind of just re-experiencing everything. She to was. And... As she was talking about it, she was re-experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really sad. It was... Good on her for, you know, getting the story out there and being able to tell like it is and, and keep herself together. But I, I do feel bad for her having to go through that. It was pretty sad. Um, where did I leave off? In your terrible British accent. Keeping a lot of herself numb, too, it is as she is so matter-of-fact. He even said it was almost like he had compassion for her, but not enough to stop. I agree. I for I'd forgotten about that to talk about that last episode. She kept saying, I need to pee, and he kept stopping. And he would look at her in a certain way that he was like, I wish I didn't have to, have to do this to you. But he still did it to her. Well, he also flat out told her, he's like, I know you don't have to go. You're just trying to get out of it. But he was still taking her over there every time anyway. Yeah. So it's like... That kind of <sighs> threw me off a little bit too. That was so bizarre. Like he was trying to care for her, but not care for her. And then he uh -huh. dropped her off and then told her... No, anyways. Well, that's what she's about to say. Then dropping her off at the petrol station and instructing her to get the, to get them to call 911 to call the police to come and get her. And then she reminds us, Cecil Hotel is the hotel he stayed in. Well, many killers that's did. That's what it was. It was run down and cheap. I legit remembered. Didn't even Google it. 
Also, Phil Ramirez has been done to death by everyone, but his capture was hilariously amusing at the end, obviously not yet shown in the series. So appreciate it from the detectives and sur survivors' perspectives. And that's what she said. And that's exactly how she sounded also. So if y'all go to Britain and you hear someone sounding like that, then that's our lovely lamb. <laughs> well, that's my British accent. Next time, do an SOS. But you know what? I have a feeling because they know I'm going to read it out in their accent. They're going to send messages and I'm going to be forced to read it in accents. Guys, I'm please just use the SOS. We, we have it up there. We put work into it. Use the SOS. <laughs> if you guys keep making Kai do her terrible voices, I'm going to need an SOS, okay? Please <laughs> just use it. <laughs> so anyway, I completely agree with Stacy, and I do thank you very much for your comment. Stacy Marie. Yeah, sorry, Stacy Marie. I can't believe we forgot to include all of that in uh, episode one. However, this is a new segment and I'm not used to reactionary stuff, so we're new to this and we'll get better. Well, hopefully we'll get better. Moving on to the second episode, though, I, I think it's interesting that we get a deeper look into the two detectives. Like, the we learned about them in the previous episode, but for the second episode, it really delves into... Mm -hmm. What they were doing, how their life was affected, their lives were affected, the people around them. I think Gill is the one that said, you know, uh, he was working like 15, 16 hour shifts or something like that. He Nobody was getting sleep at that time. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, they would have like a 15 hour day. They get a couple of drinks to attempt to unwind and then they come right back into it. And I think he even said there was a point in time where he got so worried about his family, he up and like grabbed them, went to breakfast and was going to take them to like his in-laws place. And, like, as soon as he got there and was like, I'm going to take an hour nap, mm -hmm. they called him to come back to the office. And I was like, damn. Yeah, because his, wasn't his, his wife was basically like, go to sleep. And he was yeah. like, wake me up in like an hour. And she was like, well, I think he should just go to sleep. And he was like, well, if you won't wake me up, I'll have the office call me and wake me up. Yep. And then they paged him like two minutes later and he yep. had to go. But that's yep. what I was saying. That's the difference between him in the first episode to the second episode. By the second episode, he's like, his wife was saying that he was really short with her, curt with her. You know, he was just a different person. I think he was the one that said he was getting short tempered and she that also, wasn't like She him. also said that. She also said that because okay. I remember. Um, Because I was, I was thinking, I, I was thinking when she said that, I was like, I hope she understands why and I well understood understood why and I hope she was being patient with him because I remember thinking that it's not like you know he hates his family or anything like that it's just he's trying to catch a serial killer to protect his family to protect uh, uh, the rest of the citizens and everything like that and it kind of is getting um really stressful on him so that's what I was thinking I did get a kick out of the uh the story with the like I like how the show kind of goes through to the people of LA and it 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 doesn't just talk about the murder victims. It also talks about other people who were affected by him. And I liked the story where the one cop was at home and his wife, you know, told him, I heard a noise. You should check it out. But he's all, oh, well, I have to get up in the morning. Why are you bothering me? And the one window that they never, ever would open was all the way open. And I got a kick out of the fact that the wife said, we need to call the cops. And then he was like, I am the cops. <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty funny. He said, I am the cops. And she was like, no, the police police. I think that part kind of was part of the disturbing part of this episode to me. Because they said, not that it was never even open. It was painted shut. So how in the world did he get that window open? That's my question. And it's like, to, then to me, it was like, well, locks mean nothing then. Because not only was the window locked, it was painted shut. How did he get that window open? It also was like... It was the noise that that made him leave. You know what I'm saying? Because he likes to be quiet yeah. and he likes to scare you. So he knew the noise alerted somebody and it was the noise that made him leave. But um, yeah, that whole, that part really disturbed me. I don't know why it disturbed me. And I know people are just like, oh, oh you know, he's a killer. Oh. But that part really, really disturbed me. I thought it was going to be the part where the... Um... I can never remember her position, but she worked for the force. I think she was the crime scene analyst or something like that. And her neighbor got attacked by Bridget Ramirez, was like tied up to the bed. And the only hope she had was to call out the window to this the woman the woman from the precinct and say, Hey, I need help. Hello, yeah, you neighbor. know. I, I thought that was like the most No that that was disturbing, but that wasn't the most disturbing to me. I think we just, you know, just different psyches. Um, but 
they were outside having a hot cup night and having a good old time. And it's like next door, right next door. Richard Ramirez was sitting here doing this horrible, horrible thing to somebody. And can you imagine the woman herself? She could hear what's going on outside. And she's like, I can't even scream for help. You know what I'm saying? How must yeah. that feel? Oh, my God. And uh, she had to like drag, like somehow push herself and the bed over to the window to sit there and scream for help. So, yeah, that was that was I can't even imagine being in that position. That was really something. What else stood out to you about uh, episode two? So the reason why I'm asking this is because normally I don't have the greatest of memories. So what I was doing was, was for episode one, I watched episode one like three times and took notes. Episode two, I watched it the first first time, but I couldn't bring myself to watch it again. So <laughs> I'm basically riffing off of what you are saying. The part that really started getting it going for me, like it's interesting to see how the lives of these people are being affected and, you know, what the officers are doing. I think Frank is the one that explained, you know, they came really close to just crawling up inside a bottle and, and destroying themselves. But it got really interesting for me. The next victim that he, you know, killed, he was fleeing the scene, and I, I think Gil explained that a, a patrolman pulled him over for, for speeding or some kind of traffic violation, and then Richard Ramirez heard on the radio of the patrolman's bike that they were aware of what he had just done, and they were looking for him, so he just bolted. Yeah, he drew, he drew a pentagram before... on the car and then ran. There yep. were two instances, yep. I remember. So that was the second instance. There was two instances in episode two where they would have caught him. One of them was police error. I can't remember what it was. And the second one was this one. So it, it wasn't police error, I don't think. It was because they had the car. They That's had right. his fingerprints no, it was on the hood. Error because they, they had the car. They were supposed to let them know that the car was impounded or something or put it inside, but nobody like, so like what he was saying was different precincts, they're so proud. They don't talk to each other. They don't want to share information. So they keep it to themselves. And that's the biggest issue. So nobody knew that anybody had the car. Then when they finally realized that they've had the car for, what was it, six months or something? Three months, a month, something like that. Something like uh, that. They finally went to the car, but it had been sitting out in the sun. So any kind of evidence like fingerprints and all of that stuff, the sun had already degraded it. So they couldn't use it. Well, that's the thing. I don't think when the police impound something, I don't think the impoundment lot is run by police. I might be wrong, but so like... Whoever's running that lot is the one who's responsible for putting this stuff out there. I don't think a police officer put the car out there. I think it was like an employee of this lot. I could be wrong. Lambs, SOS us. Tell me how it works. <laughs> That's why I'm saying the the office, the police office, it was the fact that it was supposed to be told to someone. And again, I apologize. I know y'all want more information from us, but we also want you to go and watch the episode. We're not just trying to take it away from Netflix. And at the same time, like I said, I only watched it once and I couldn't bring myself to watch it again. So my recollection is kind of vague. Yeah, if you don't want to watch, if you don't have time to watch the whole show and you're coming here to experience the show, <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> That's so, not what this is yeah, for. Yeah, it was... So yeah, y'all let us know. Send us an SOS or send us a message in the comments below. But it was it was both the impound lot and the that specific police office because they were supposed to either put the ticket in evidence or something. They were supposed to do something with the ticket, and that's be, that's why he said you know police stations don't like to share um, information, and that's a detriment to cases and stuff like that. Because it was an issue with that station that they were supposed to share or do something with it, and they didn't do it. Yeah, I will. I will agree that them not cooperating with everybody was a little iffy, and um, I just don't think that the the lot. I don't think a police officer put the car outside. I think it was someone else who did that. But yeah, them not coordinating with each other was a little iffy. And even Frank said, you know, if you run across any street in that area you essentially run through, like, four different districts in, like, five minutes. So the fact that they're physically that close-knit, 
but they're not working together it just made zero yeah, that's sense crazy. to me. If they were just working together, they probably would have caught him sooner. More than likely, yeah. Where was this cop when this guy took off running? <laughs> Did he just watch him run away? Like, what's up with that? I think they said it was late at night, and he was on, like, the side of a highway, so I'm guessing he either, like, disappeared into, like, the woods nearby, or he ran through traffic. I don't, I don't think they really said. I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't but... remember them saying that at all. I remember him saying he drew a pen. He heard it over the radio that they were looking for him. The car happened. The car ended up being stolen. Um... So when he heard that, he drew a pentagram on the car and then said, feet don't fail me now. Like, that's literally what the, the cop was recollecting. And then he just took off running. I don't remember hearing him say the the cop ran after him or anything like that, because I remember thinking, well, where's the cop? So, right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my takeaway from episode two. Like I said, episode two really disturbed me, so I need a break from it. So we're going to start on a new episode uh, next week or a new, a new show next week. So Rick, what are we talking about next week? Next week, we're going to be talking about Making a Murderer, the story of Stephen Avery. So yeah, if y'all have an issue with, of, with us jumping around from you know show to show, let us know. Oh, Kai, wait, since we're not going to be doing episode three, we should probably inform the lambs that episode two ends with they find the business card for the dentist in his car. Oh, yes. Yes. And that's the other thing. If they had shared that information, they would have caught him. They missed him by, what, three days or something like that? Something like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the whole, they ended with, they were waiting. They have they have undercover undercover cops there waiting. So, y'all, y'all got to wait for us to continue watching it. We're going to all watch it together. But just give Kai a little while, because mental health and everything like that, if I keep watching it, we're just not going to finish this whole segment. It's just not going to happen. And I don't even know, it might start to affect love and murder. Doing true crime is really hard on your, your mental health. People don't think so because, you know, y'all don't do it. Y'all just listen to it. But actually doing it. If you want to hear more about being a true crime podcaster, that's actually the bonus episode we put out for this week. So if you want to hear more about our behind the scenes of being a true crime podcaster and everything like that, then join us on Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder and um, join at the $5 above tier. And you can hear more about that. But I kind of need a break from Richard Ramirez. Not everybody is the same. Y'all are probably like, oh, you're such a pussy. Well, then I'm a pussy, but I still need a break from it. (laughs) But uh, so what we're doing next week is episode one of Making a Murderer, something that my husband has been on me to start watching anyway. So I just need to start watching that. And uh, But stick with us. We're going to continue on with Richard Ramirez a little bit later. And like I was saying, if y'all don't like us uh, jumping around like this from episode to, like not episode, but uh, from show to show let us know and we will try and do better i'll try my best can't promise anything but that's what we have for you this week send us an sos go to www.murderandlove.com and right there on the home page you'll see the sos button send us a shout out or you can just get the link in the show notes below i have the link the direct link to our shout out system there let us know what you think about episode one episode two and you can tell us what you think about episode one of making a murderer so we can get you heard on next week's episode do you have anything to add rick use the SOS system. Or else Kai will be forced to do her accent and you don't want to hear Irish and Australian and like Puerto Rican and Mexican. You don't want to hear, you don't want to hear even my Midwestern American accent. You you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it to yourselves. (laughs) I'm half tempted to just be like, if you guys keep leaving comments, we're just going to cut you off at the third comment until you do an SOS. (laughs) We're not going to do that. Leave a comment. (laughs) No, but if you guys push us, I might. (laughs) But join us every Sunday for our full-length free episodes. If you want it commercial-free, you already know what to do. Other than that, this is Kai and Rick signing off. See ya. Have a good day, everybody.